I think in the future learning will be more open and more accessible and more varied so that more people are able to learn in different ways and in di for different purposes across the lifespan so that learning will be life wide and lifelong. We might argue that learning has always been available, but often it was available in fairly, fairly narrow forms and to perhaps only a small section of the population worldwide. Uh, learning will be more accessible, more open and more available freely to everyone at any time and for any reason. There will be big changes in, in learning that will, that will come down the line and some of that is around the, the, the structures that we have in terms of a, a degree looking at micro-credentials, just-in-time training, um, and the way that e education might get, is getting, I suppose, packaged into, into smaller kind of samples. The future of learning is uh, uh, online and digital, because we need to uh, follow the, and adapt to and be proactive with the uh, UNESCO and uh, United Nations uh, development goals, especially in education, number four but also that, that the SDG 4 have influences and impact on all the other SDGs. And the only way forward is online uh, to reach the education for all. So the future of learning is um, likely to be much more flexible, more blended, more hybrid across the continuum of formal and informal learning. I think in terms of the process and uh, who is involved in the learning process, I think we're going to see many more, in, many more stakeholders involved. So it will be in higher education, academics working with learning designers and other stakeholders to make learning more engaging and especially as it goes more online. Outside of higher education and of, of other formal uh, education, we're going to see online learning uh, and online um, pedagogies coming into play within industry. Again, we can see that with some of the big industry players like IBM, Amazon. Uh, they're, in, they're investing in uh, education for their, for their staff and their employees. And I think we're going to see more organizations uh, utilizing online learning. Uh, the current model is often that people are spending a number of days attending workshops uh, that, that disrupts their, their whole work process by, by making uh, certainly the theoretical elements available online that staff can do in their own time and then perhaps coming for shorter workshops where they actually uh, participate in activities that uh, reinforce that, that theory. We're going to see those kind of changes. So it was just in time training for, for industry and industry requirements will become um, a, a much bigger user of online education. So away from higher education, online learning gives many more organisations such as NGOs and businesses the opportunity to upskill their employees or their target audiences. And so I think that there's potential for collaboration between universities and other organisations. So perhaps it's not so much that online learning will take away um, students from higher education, but that there will be opportunities for more authentic collaborations and um, curriculum development going forward. Outside of the higher education context, online learning can be useful to people across their lifespan from childhood right through to older adults post-retirement for any purpose, whether that be employment related, upskilling, credentialing, retraining, but also for reasons that are personal and spiritual and to do with hobbies and self-actualization in the widest possible form. Online learning can cater for any learning, for any person, for any reason. Imagine a world where the highest quality learning is open to all, regardless of status, location or circumstances. That's what we're building. We're FutureLearn. Our purpose is to transform access to education. We're jointly owned by the Open University and the SEEK Group, world leaders in distance education and employment businesses. We've reached over 10 million learners to date we're a multi-award winning team with the skills, passion and plan to deliver the best online learning experience. We offer a huge selection of courses from over 175 leading universities and organisational partners all over the world. 
We make learning simple, one step at a time on mobile, tablet and desktop, so you can fit your learning around your life. And we underpin it all with social learning. What's social learning? Put simply, it's harnessing the power of the community. We learn best when we share and debate ideas with fellow learners, understanding different experiences and perspectives, filling the gaps in our own knowledge. It adds an entirely new dimension and creates a richer learning experience. We make all this happen with flexible short courses, programs, micro-credentials and degrees. Each course is created by a leading university or organisation and made up of bite-sized lessons. You can usually start learning for free. Short course upgrades offer access to all course materials and the chance to earn a certificate. Our unlimited offer allows you to pay once a year to upgrade on as many courses as you like. Paid courses offer a more focused, professionally orientated learning community. Sponsored courses help organisations widen participation in higher education or meet responsibility goals. Our programmes enable you to learn in depth with groups of courses that help you explore different aspects of a topic. Our micro credentials allow you to upskill or reskill with short stackable courses that award academic credit or recognition of prior learning. We offer a growing range of accredited undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Degrees are arranged as sets of courses which you can take flexibly, depending on how much time you want to commit each term. We also support our academic partners, public bodies and various organisations with a range of extra services. These include course creation, quick authoring for faster course development and improved learning design, plus end-to-end -end support from your own dedicated team. Course analytics to better understand your learner demographics and what they think of your courses. Learner management. Guide cohorts with powerful course facilitation tools. Track and support individual learners. Income generation. A revenue share of paid courses and upgrades as well as tools to attract learners to further study with your organisation. Employers can also use FutureLearn in the workplace to upskill or reskill employees. FutureLearn, transforming access to education. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name's Holly, and I work in the partnership teams at FutureLearn. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dean and Professor Patricia Davidson from the School of Nursing at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. JHU was one of FutureLearn's first partners in the U.S., and Trish is now lead educator on a very successful COVID-related course on our platform on the topic of nursing in low resource areas. Working with Trish at JHU has been an inspirational experience, and I'm sure this keynote will be no different. She has been a registered nurse since 1980 and has clinical teaching and practice expertise in cardiovascular science and the care of vulnerable populations. Across her career, she has been committed to developing innovative models of person-centered care delivery and evidence-based teaching. She is deeply committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as workforce development and interdisciplinary practice. Uh, please do feel free to enter your questions in the chat and we'll have some time at the end. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dean Davidson. So, so thanks so much, Holly, for that very warm and generous introduction. Um, in the next half an hour or so, I just wanted to share my thoughts and reflections on a period which I considered to be a watershed in higher education. And let's think together about what may be some of the ways forward. So what I'd like to cover is just an overview of the university in contemporary society. Just reflect on some of the social, political and economic factors that influence higher education. Like what is probably front and centre on many of your minds, talk about how COVID-19 and our emergence from this pandemic will likely affect the sector and also present to you some potential approaches to reinvigorate the social contract of universities within society. 
So this graph here just provides an overview of the history of higher education. And as you can see, universities have been around for centuries. But certainly it has been in this century that we have really seen the emergence of higher education, not just as a vehicle of providing education for students, but also as a big business. And I think this is something that people don't often reflect upon sufficiently. So now there's over 18,000 universities across the world and 40% of 25 to 34 year old um, individuals in OECD countries and nearly 50% of 25 to 34 year olds in the United States graduate from universities. In sub-Saharan Africa, universities' degrees provide a 21% return on investment over the course of a lifetime of an individual. At the other end of the spectrum, in countries such as Scandinavia, where there is much more uh, economic prosperity and less debt involved in education and more, student, more individuals available to access it, there is a lesser return of about 9%. But what is probably one of the key factors that has influenced the notion of the modern university is academic mobility. And we know that internationalization across many universities around the world has been an intentional strategy. That's not to say that the motivations for inter internationalization have always been clear and transparent, but certainly an overarching goal has been in terms of knowledge sharing, accelerating innovation, and also facilitating some of the goals of globalization. And we know, and have, up until COVID-19 at least, that 2.5 million students study outside of their home country. And this has been one of the very disruptive factors of COVID-19. So again, this is just a slide showing that there is a lifetime not net benefit of getting a degree. And this is across all countries at a varying level. So it's definitely education is worth the investment. But what we have really seen, and I think this is an important focus for all education providers, that we've seen this notion of democratization of education and shifting away from the few elite having access to education to the multiple worthy. And this has been something in particular that FutureLearn uh, focuses on in terms of its mission. And also, I really firmly believe in my career that as Nelson Mandela has said, that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. However, in the history of universities, particularly in maybe the last 20 or 30 years, there has been significant pressures to make universities more independent. There has been a contraction of funding um, particularly for state-based institutions. And in countries such as the United Kingdom, Australia, where the majority of funding comes from the government, there's been a real contraction of that funding. There has also been discussion and debate about what is the role of higher education. And many people talk about the vocationalization of university education. The value of learning is perhaps not held in the same level of primacy as being able to leave university and get a job. And this is particularly from critics of the university sector. And I think what has become very evident in recent months is that the internationalization of education cannot be divorced from political processes geopolitical factors, and in real time, the impact of global pandemics. And as I mentioned previously, universities are big business and denying the need for new business models really threatens our future. So perhaps, you know, as a dean, I can say, you know, the fact that you have a, a small classes with high faculty costs and high building costs is prohibitive. But yet for many, some people consider that the universities 
are a little bit separate from business accountabilities. But for our critics, they are more thoughtfully and intentionally after universities in terms of accountability. So as a consequence around the world, you've seen many research assessment exercises, um, particularly in the United Kingdom, countries in Europe and Australia. And this is how governments are trying to get accountability for the investment. And also in some ways, um, fostering selective excellence. This is just an example um, from the University of California system in the United States. And this, uh, the University of California system provides education to many students in that state and also has some really impressive um, educational institutions such as the University of California, San Francisco, University of California, Los Angeles, and University of California, Davis, just to mention some of them. But as you can see here in this slide, the top bar, the yellow bar, is what is the real amount of dollars that it would take to really um, allow the UC system to optimise in effectiveness. Now, this is not to say that these dollars are not, are not being achieved, but these are dollars are not being achieved for state from state funding. So this has put a lot of pressure on universities um, to look for entrepreneurial activities and also to leverage philanthropy. Unfortunately, across the world, this in particular, the investment in large numbers of international students has been really, really disruptive. So in parallel, also, there is an increasing scepticism of the value of science. Moves towards nationalism and populism have really contracted people's desire to collaborate across the world. And we've actually seen that um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also we cannot deny the politicization of higher education. And as you can see um, in this slide, from the Pew Research Centre, which looks at the attitudes of people who are conservative in their politics, which are the representative, and more liberal in their politics, which is the demographic um, voters, that there is a difference in, in the value of the perception of education. And we just have to look around the world as who are the current ruling leaders in many countries are from a much more conservative political disposition. And as a consequence, this impacts on the role of university in society. Um, and this is a quote uh, from uh, um, a very prominent scholar in Australia just this week, as the Australian government announced that they were going to increase the fees for people undertaking um, liberal arts subjects and humanities, um, really trying to force people into career ready positions. And in response, Tim um, Sustamesani uh, said that many of the government harbour suspicions of tenured radicals stalking the corridors of academe. Conservatives have come to think of universities as incubators of progressive thinking and so-called political correctness. So how we position the modern university in the, in the current times is really challenging. So what has happened around the world is that people have really tried to align universities, particularly motivated by national regional interest. And we've seen some of these um, alignments. The Bologna process in Europe was um, really designed to harmonise uh, qualifications and facilitate movement around the EU. Brasilia, Russia, India, China and South Africa have aligned in a consortia called BRICS um, to really look at the economic interests of these emerging national economies. And of course, the Built and Road Initiative um, fostered by the Chinese government has really tried to position in the region or mo mostly around um, economic stability, growth and prospering. And then also we've seen a move in terms of, you know, the, the degree and the university. Um, we've seen, you know, this is the model of the traditional um, way of undertaking a PhD, of 
a very solitary process with a single professor where you deliver at the end of three to five years um, many kilos of paper, which probably only you, your advisor, your examiners, and your mother, if she's really loves you, has read, to a much more different way on how we look at advanced degrees and doctoral degrees. And as I mentioned, globalisation, which really um, offered significant promise in terms of increasing dialogue across nations and governments, has been both a two-edged sword and we've seen a real contraction. And in fact, I love this uh, cover of The Economist last year that talked about snobilization. So the factors that we've really seen in academia around global knowledge sharing and exchange have been subject to factors that are contracting, not necessarily focusing on expansion. And of course, we've seen uh, Brexit and many other moves towards nationalism having really deep and profound impact on the academy and research and innovation. So looking at the university's future without considering these political aspects is at our peril. So in the midst of this context, this is all happening. This is the geopolitical world we live in, this is the political we, world we live in, and then we are faced with a pandemic, unprecedented, unprepared for, and the times ahead uncertain. Not only do we face a pandemic for which there is no vaccine, limited understanding of the pathophysiology and effective treatment, we have seen um, the cracks in society laid bare. And so these are data from the United States just looking at um, mortality from COVID-19 by race. And these data are not unique to the United States. Um, in the United Kingdom, similar health disparities are seen in black and minority ethnic groups. And so this is a real need for focus and recognition. So what we've seen in the world is probably a constellation of processes that have colluded to really result in significant social discord. In the context of a pandemic in the United States, we had some very high profile unlawful killings of black Americans. And this is really spurred a revolution around the world of people challenging a whole lot of issues around social determinants of health and how these impact on societal participation. And of course, we know education is one of these important factors. So this is going to force all of us, whether we're in sitting in um, ivory tower, <laughs> Ivy League, institutions or in community colleges or working in the online environment. We really need to think about this is what is the role and value proposition of universities globally? Are all universities created equally? And what is our social contract with society? And most importantly, I think where we have failed miserably is developing effective business models that are going to sustain us for the longer term. COVID has also meant that many universities around the world are experiencing disastrous financial shortfalls in the many millions. Students are uh, having been challenged in returning to international sites and we're seeing a huge contraction of both faculty and staffing profiles in universities. But it's not all bad news because for many of us who have seen the power of digitalization and the power of online education as a democratizing force have been really excited about this COVID-19 putting online education in front and center. And we'll talk a little bit more about what are the things that we have to do to make individuals feel that online education is a value proposition. 
as a dean and i've been puzzled by uh, many students sort of saying we need a discount in fees for the online education but any of us who've done online education well know that really in fact particularly unless you can scale to thousands and thousands of students, online education is expensive to provide a quality product. So there's a recent report from the um, Economic Intelligence Unit uh, sponsored by The Economist and um, actually funded by the Qatar Foundation that produced a really a, a menu of what may be some of the factors that we could consider moving forward. They um, talked about the role of online universities um, and flexible models of learning delivery. Um, and they talked about the cluster model, eliminating the traditional siloed nature of university campuses by fusing multiple institutions. And really when you stop and think about um, if you could minimize some of the competition between universities, what could be achieved? They talk about experiential models, which are much more driven by structured mentor experiences and internships, but that would require a total rethink. They talk about liberal arts colleges and which are much more popular in the United States where people go into a four year college degree straight out of school before they identify a specialization. Um, but what we know in the United States is that the liberal arts college model is really struggling and institutions without robust endowments are looking at closing. And then also what they think about is the partnership model where um, institutions build relationships, particularly with industry partners to secure long-term uh, funding and improve job prospects for students. Now, I think each and every one of these models has some merit, but really what they are also missing is a view of what is the research and social commitment of universities. So universities are not just about providing degrees. They're not just about providing knowledge, skills and competencies. They're about innovation, discovery, generation of new thought. And what we've seen, particularly in many universities, that they have been really the nucleus for much of innovation in society. And much of this innovation has been investigator-driven initiatives. But we still have not got that business model right. And any administrator in a university will tell you that for probably every research dollar that is, comes in the door in real terms probably costs another 50% um, at least and probably double to, do, to really keep the lights on and maintain infrastructure and regulation. The other very important part that universities play in society um, particularly is the role of anchor institutions. Now they can be the role anchor institutions mainly because they're big employers. So in where I live in the state of Maryland, Johns Hopkins University is the biggest employer in the state. But also I think many universities have deep and long contracts to develop and sustain their local communities. And so for here in, jo in Baltimore, which is a city with facing significant challenges and has over many decades, um, initiatives such as Source is a service learning centre um, which we use in our schools of medicine, nursing and public health that contribute to the community. So how do we fund research? How do we fund faculty development? How do we fund um, initiatives to support communities is something that we really need to think about. Also, I think we, in the in the evolution of, of um, universities, we need to think about the role of communication. And in many days, I do feel like my life has come to 140 characters and my real barometer of what's happening in the world is Twitter. But this also opens us up to the world in a whole different 
uh, way in terms of accountability and accessing information. We cannot deny that we're in a very uh, digital world. Um, it's great. Today, I get to speak to you from Baltimore in the United States to people from all over the world. But how do we really re leverage this technology to the betterment of individuals and society and as a consequence, uh, universities? We also need to think that, you know, we, many of us are now um, employing social media in education and certainly what we can see coming out of much of discussion and debate and really catalyzed by the COVID-19 pandemic is the importance of digital education. Just as I come to the end of my remarks, I really wanted to put the role of universities in the context of a global picture. So many of you will be aware, these are the global goals from the United Nations, the Sustainable Development Goals. And even though these are 17 discrete goals with multiple targets, we really need to look at this roadmap as playing a critical role in how we achieve a prosperous world. Even though each and us would look at this, and many people on this call are probably looking at number four and thinking quality education, that's what universities are all about. But we are not going to achieve this unless we have gender equality, unless we have peace and justice, and importantly, we have good health and no poverty. The other thing that I think is really important to think about is the context of education across all sectors, but also in the context of economic factors. Here is a, some work from Peter Burhaus, who's a leading nurse economist in the United States. And as you can see, this um, graph shows the growth of numbers of registered nurses. But the important thing to take from this slide is that each of these um, surges in growth have been moderated by economic factors. And as you can see, in 2009 and 2010, the Great Recession actually resulted in a surge of enrolments um, in nursing, uh, largely driven by the fact that many other jobs were um, made redundant and people looked to what was going to be a stable and, and satisfying career. Who knows what COVID-19 will present? Because what is very different about this current pandemic is that it's had a huge onslaught on the economic productivity of the healthcare system. Many healthcare systems have had to sh shut down. And so when no one is quite sure what lies ahead. But an important message for universities is thinking about their role and function within the context of current economic environments and what may lay ahead. So I am very optimistic, even though I've perhaps given you um, some pretty gloomy details about some of the challenges we face. But this is a recent slide from McKinsey who have looked at, you know, what are going to be the factors that are going to make for robust, resilient companies for the future. And they talk about um, expanding the ability to operate in a fully digital environment. Um, developing cognitive skills that promote redesign and innovation, strengthening social and emotional skills, and building adaptable and resilient systems. Now, for most of us, much of the abilities and the skills to do this work and the networks happen in universities. So I'm very sure that we'll be able to deliver in some shape or form, but many models will have to change. So until we have a vaccine for COVID-19, I think our lives are going to be in a certain level of confusion and disarray. But it's going to be the robust and the resilient who are going to emerge stronger and more powerful. So these are just some of these things that I think we should be thinking about 
at this watershed moment in higher education and the history of the world. I think models of higher education have to be explicit in an agenda. And if for-profit is the agenda, then there needs to be some clear recognition of the product that students will be receiving. And perhaps then they will get an excellent technical education, but maybe not have the exposure to other research experiences and social learning. I think what is probably critically important is particularly as we look at um, the increasing numbers of conservative governments who do not see the value of universities. And in fact, we have seen very evident in the COVID-19 pandemic, a skepticism of science. Somehow we need to be able to reconfigure our social contract and demonstrate our value proposition. Interestingly, if you looked at um, the world and reporting of what's happening in uh, COVID-19, where would the world be without the Johns Hopkins map? And how that Johns Hopkins map ended up, started was with a professor and one graduate student, an international student from China, wanting to track it. So this is an example of how innovation can uh, move forward. I think we definitely need to look at harmonization and different uh, approaches. Um, that is one of the very exciting factors of the Future Learn platform is the potential for micro-credentialing and also drawing together talents around the world to provide a multifaceted view of a particular topic. I think we've really got to, we all have talked about lifelong learning for many years, but we have to move from tokenism to really meaningful clinical learning. I think we really need to look at diversity, equity and inclusion because education is a pathway to participation and I hope reconfigured teaching and learning strategies will foster diversity, equity and inclusion. And I applaud Future Learn today for their posting on Twitter, recognising that Black Lives Matter. I think we need dynamic and reflexive business models and this requires um, you know, drawing in different um, levels of thought, getting these people in business schools who make these great models to come and work with people like me, nursing deans, to develop the most effective and efficient models. I think universities still struggle for internal governance and accountability. You've just seen the uproar around the world um, as jobs have been lost. Um, uh, there is much debate and discussion. And I think if nothing else, what will really sustain universities for the future is partnerships. Um, and they will be critical, but as in all of these great ideas, the devil will be in the detail. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I look forward to taking some questions. Thank you so much, Dean Davidson, for that presentation. We do have a few questions for you. Uh, the first is from Janice, and Janice asks, if all universities are not equal, equal, how do we achieve equity of outcome value for the employment market? Well, I think it really depends about what is the role and the function of the university. And I think, um, you know, to achieve equity doesn't mean that you, everybody gets all of the same things. And I think that is the, important to recognise. And so I think people need to be clear about what are their goals and targets. And we know that if we are going to increase the diversity and success of students, we have to invest equally. So just thinking that students are going to come in and one size fits all, I think in the days of the past, we need much more tailored and targeted uh, solutions. And I think part of the problem is that all universities think they've got to have be all things to all people. Great, and we have another question from Janice, uh, who says she works within a university with focus on employment, but many academics are uncomfortable with this, this approach, uh, as are some students. Uh, how do you suggest we square that circle? Well, you know, I think, again, it's being clear and transparent with the user <laughs> that comes. Um, and, uh, and, 
there's nothing wrong with having a job. And so I think basically you just, what I would be thinking is that you want to be able to focus on attracting students that realise that there's a vocational um, element of instruction and education. And I, to be honest, I think in universities, we've kind of thought for many years money was a dirty word and we didn't have to think about cost. I think also it's recognising is um, what is the social role of employment. And, you know, I, for example, am a dean in a school of nursing, which has a very vocational focus, um, even though we're an all graduate school here. So, um, you know, I think that's okay. But, you know, the idea, I think many academics uh, still think that talking about money and the end product um, is challenging. But for those schools that have employability as their focus, what I think is really important that they make sure that students understand that and that they have some mentored or observing ship experiences early in the, in the course to make sure that um, it, it's going to be the job they want. Um, there's nothing worse than, you know, being, as we've seen, people being sort of drift, funneled into certain courses and after three years uh, don't want to do the job. Because say to me, if I someone graduates from the School of Nursing and says, I don't want to be a nurse, I feel that we've failed either in our selection and providing realistic experiences so that the individual works out that's what they want to do. Because the market, even though this, a degree in nursing has broad marketability, it's not, they're not going to, uh, maybe they should have done an MBA or something else. Well, one more question. This one's from me. Actually, there are a few more questions here, but the next one's from me, and it kind of relates to your comments about uh, connections with industry and employability. Um, so I wonder if Johns Hopkins has been able to develop some of these partnerships with industry and, and how that worked, how that has worked for you. Okay, so probably one of the biggest industries that we partner with specifically is the Johns Hopkins Health System which is a huge health system across the world. And so, um, so we partner with them specifically in, in addressing workforce needs. We've worked with, partnered with um, several other pub, private hospital um, settings to make sure that um, firstly that the graduates uh, get the necessary knowledge, skills and competencies. And certainly um, also in technology, we've partnered with many vendors, um, particularly around, um, you know, personalised healthcare. So to me, in a way, um, partnering with industry is much easier than many other partners because often the goals are very clear and transparent. Um, so I've, I'm very open and... Um, and I think really, unless governments around the world markedly change their position, um, you know, partnering with the industry is going to be a, a really important uh, focus for the future. Thank you. And now the questions are piling in. So I'm going to read you some of them as they're, they're, they're a little complex here. You, you discuss the positive potential for micro-credentials and harm, harmonization of qualifications to the global community. But in relation to universities being key to local communities, how do we focus on local knowledges and realities? And that one's from uh, Marev. Okay. So um, I think, firstly, in terms of micro-credentials, I think people need to be able to uh, create their own learning agenda. I think that's really important. And um, I think this will be really useful for, in particular, people configuring degrees, either based upon they can't afford a full degree or they want to compile um, knowledge, skills and competencies in a way that can be communicated to employers. That's one thing. The other thing is about and I absolutely agree that in many instances you have to ta tailor and target learnings that are appropriate to local communities. And this is really important for diversity. 
So, for example, um, how do you uh, develop courses that are applicable for um, Indigenous people? How do you embrace Indigenous learning? And also, in particular, in, say, a city such as Baltimore, in which I live, where the majority of people are African-American, you know, how do we present information that is respectful? Um, how do we avoid, uh, you know, stereotypes? How do we go out of it, you know, thoughtfully and intentionally make sure that faculty in those courses uh, reflect people's experiences? So I don't think things are mutually exclusive um, from having sort of broader international perspectives to local perspectives. And in fact, one of the things that I find is like we have um, researchers, for example, who are doing exactly the same intervention in the DRC and South Africa as um, East Baltimore. Because, you know, even I'm at Johns Hopkins, a world famous hospital, but we know just two blocks away, health outcomes are really inferior in African American populations populations compared to white Americans. So I think we do have a, have a lot to do. And I think um, I probably haven't given a very um, clear answer, but I think the questions you're asking are critical because these are the issues that get to formulate a social contract where members of society are going to think that universities are worth funding and that education is worthwhile. Excuse the noise in the background. There's a helipad. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a, a related question, and I wonder if you think the rise of online learning will in, help to increase access. I absolutely think so. Um, I think in my career, I've undeniably seen that online learning has increased access. I think online learning is, is often very student-centric. The challenges in online learning is often faculty who have really, you know, been taught to teach in the sage on the stage mentality. And I'm one of them, and it takes some unlearning un, uh, to do. I do, you know, where possible, think that it's great there can be some hybrid learning experiences for people that need them. Um, because I think um, there is the potential that online education could potentiate disparities. Because basically, you know, if you, if you just get all the information you need and you don't need any of the other skills that come from an education. You know, we often talk about the hidden curriculum. You know, how do you interact with peers? You know, how do you cultivate social skills? It's not to say that can't be done in the online medium, but if, if they have to be thoughtfully and in, intentional. So I think that the great thing about COVID-19 is that it's pushed online learning front and centre. The big things that we have to address is that online learning is perceived by some as being inferior. Um, but, you know, places that were really resistant to online education, particularly the Middle East and China, in the context of COVID-19, have really had to rally. So um, I think uh, demonstrating the quality of online education um, is something that we really have to do. But I'm excited about the opportunities ahead. I am too. Do you have time for one more question? Absolutely. Okay, this one's from Emma, and Emma asks, do you think that the user sees less value in online learning than face-to-face, -face, and this can often lead to lack of motivation, higher drop-off for online learning, and how can universities uh, translate the value of face-to-face -face learning in online sessions to keep learners engaged? Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent question, and I think, you know, definitely one way to keep students on track is the synchronous mode. Um, so, um, we all know uh, that you, 
there's varying levels of, of uh, motivation. So, but I think there's a lot of pedagogical techniques to promote engagement. And I really like some of the social learning principles of that the FutureLearn platform offers. But also, you know, what I do in my own teaching is also um, focus on uh, synchronous classes, if possible, but if not, um, also some additional, you know, check-ins. I think many ways of fostering communication. And then like any other form of teaching, you know, it's pretty easy to miss um, someone who doesn't turn up um, to class, um, you know, in big lecture halls. Sorry about the noise. But, um, uh, but you know, checking roles, checking whether people are um, online. And in fact, one of the universities that I work with, UTS, um, was actually using AI um, with their online learning management system to really develop an algorithm to identify students at, at risk. That is, you know, people who weren't logging in or logging in five minutes before the assignment was due. So I think we, there's a lot of Well, that's okay. I think we lost you for a minute. Sounds like they're tearing your building down. Um, yeah. I hope I hope that you're all right. Yeah, um, I'm not. I just like to take this time to to thank you for for sharing your thoughts with us and uh, participating in our uh, festival of learning. Um, I'm sure you might get some more questions from the audience uh, later. And uh, just thank you for your help. It's great to see you today. Thank you. As a learning designer at FutureLearn, it's fair to say that I love learning. And from a design perspective, I love to see courses with a good mix of step types and learning types, the ways in which learners can interact and engage with the course material and each other. A course I love that does this really well is A History of Rural Food and Feasting. It's by the University of Reading. It presents historical accounts, gives learners choice and space to explore with lots of extra resources. It fosters discussion about contemporary attitudes to food and feasting and has a really strong narrative. It keeps you engaged, you're aware of what's coming up and you're excited to move through the course. I particularly love the innovative ways in which the team have encouraged learner production. The course has even got recipes so you can try them out at home, which is just a brilliant way to get people involved. They have examples of recipes to make and then they can share their experience and pictures on a Padlet wall. This is such a great way to encourage social learning experience. I'm a big fan of this course called Becoming a Better Music Teacher from the ABRSM. It's been hugely popular with music teachers from all over the world and I think one particular step demonstrates why. Early on in the course, the instructors introduce the concept of a teaching philosophy, basically the core principles that lie at the heart of someone's approach to teaching. They then use the discussion step to ask learners to share their own personal teaching philosophies. It's a course aimed at teaching professionals, and most teachers I know love to talk about their professional practice. So as you can imagine, the question elicits some rich responses. These are a few responses from music teachers taking the course. My philosophy is to inspire a love of music through self-expression instead of aiming to achieve perfect technicality. Music should be fun and pupils love doing it. Pupils will only be motivated to improve if they have a genuine love of what they're doing. My new philosophy is to build the skills of students to read music in the same way they would read their favourite book. This starts with teaching them how to read music, then exploring the story of each musical piece. My teaching philosophy is to inspire pupils of all ages, my instruction is always tailored to the individual needs of the pupil. I enjoy the challenge of making my lessons interesting and fun and being part of their musical journey. But as you can see, the engagement from these teachers is very high, making it a fantastic example of social learning as well as an opportunity for individual reflection. My favourite FutureLearn course that I've done was called Gravity, the Big Bang, Black Holes and Gravitational Waves by Parry Diderot. I actually did this course a couple of years ago but because it was presented in such an interesting way, it's really stuck in my mind. I love learning more about physics and our universe, and for me, this course was special because it was packed with such engaging and sometimes very funny videos that really helped me understand the material. 
So for example, in this step looking at the law of falling bodies, the lead educator uses a mixture of special effects, real-time experiments and traditional classroom techniques. So I think he uses a whiteboard to bring physics to life. You really feel like you're in a personal classroom with him, just with the added benefit of a green screen. You don't feel like you're being lectured to, it's more like you're having a really engaging conversation. And that's the reason I'll remember the course for years to come. My favourite course on the FutureLearn platform is called Genomic Medicine Transforming Patient Care in Diabetes from the University of Exeter. As a type 1 diabetic myself, I found this course really informative. When I was diagnosed at 16, type 1 diabetes was only ever explained to me at a very basic level, and access to this course meant that I could learn so much more about my condition that I never even knew. The social learning community on this course is made up of a mixture of healthcare professionals and people who either have type 1 diabetes themselves or have someone close to them affected by the condition. I particularly appreciated the patient's stories throughout the course and I found Dan's story in week 2 particularly memorable as we were diagnosed at the same age and I could really relate to this story. I'm really thankful that this course exists on the platform and is a resource for people across the world living with diabetes. I love learning that helps connect an online course to things I can show people easily and help them see why the topic I'm studying is fun and engaging. I'm quite digital and a bit of a paperphobe, so it may surprise people when I say one of my favourite courses on FutureLearn is Flexagons and the Math Behind Twisted Paper with Yossi Alran from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Yossi has a wonderful ability to bridge that awkward gap between the digital platform of FutureLearn with our own world by using just colourful pieces of paper. Several parts of the course encourage learners to leave the platform in order to print out templates of folding paper that help explain complex mathematics and the curious minds of mathematicians. Look, it's a folding piece of paper. The purpose is to talk about the way these mathematical marvels work and why they have captured people's imaginations for many years. They even inspired Richard Feynman's work that led to a Nobel Prize. I enjoy this course on a personal level because it uses very lo-fi technology, paper, which can go from explaining why a one-edged piece of twisted paper could lead you on a journey of complex maths and discovery.